Happy Easter. He is risen. Almost. He is risen. There we go. All right. So we're going to spend some time looking at the gospel of John and John chapter 20. And how many kids are in the audience? Put up your hand if you're a kid in the audience. <laughs> I got more hands than I thought. Good. Excellent. All right. So what we're going to do today, we're going to, we're going to, kids, we're going to play a game. Eric, do you like to play games? Are games good? Yes. Okay. For this game, you've got to pay close attention. I want to see, can you pay better attention than the adults? I want to see. I will see if you can pay good attention. So when I say he is risen, we normally say, now that's fun and that's good. And we're supposed to do that. But kids, if you hear he is risen, I, I want you to stand up on your feet, up on your feet and then guns up because he's risen indeed. Okay. So let's try it. I'm going to try it, kids. Are you ready? Just the kids. He is risen. One of you got it. Two of you got it. Okay. So the other thing, kids, I want you to pay attention. Watch, watch. I want you to see who's the last kid to stand up. So all the kids, he is risen. You got it. All right. So every time he is risen, I want you to rise up on your feet. And then I want you to look. I want you to see which, who's the last kid to get up on their feet. Okay. So <clears throat> adults, if you want to stand up on your feet too, you can also. You're welcome. So this Easter, we are going to be looking at the most important story of all time. We're carefully going to look at the story of Easter. We're going to take some time to digest the reality, the realness of what Easter is to us. And we'll look at how does this impact our life today here in St. Helens. So those are the three things we're going to do today. And we're hopefully going to have a little bit of fun as we do it. I want to remind you that in this story, we're all the way back in 32 AD. We're in Israel, and yes, they carved almost entire cities out of the rock in this time. And so carving tombs, graves out of the rock, was something that they used to do in ancient Israel. He is risen. Got it, got it, got it. Yes, all right. So some of you have got it, and some of you need a little more practice. So one more time. He is risen. Yes, you got it. Okay, so in case you're wondering, the front left section is going to win every time because they will not be outdone by anyone. So here we go. We're going to read in John chapter 20. So adults, if you want to open up your Bible or if you want to open up your Bible app, I'm going to assume that's what you're doing. John chapter 20. We're going to read um, the first verses here in John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone had been moved from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb. He bent down to look, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen lap wrappings lying there. And the cloth that had been on Jesus' head was not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in, in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. This is God's precious and holy word. He is risen. Oh, oh, some of you got it. Some of you missed it. All right. Okay, so kids, I want, I want you to listen very carefully. If I was to call you up onto the stage, ooh, some of you are like trembling and some of you are like, yes, I want to be on the stage. Yes. And I was to ask you to retell the Easter story. How many of you think you could retell the story? 
If the adults were like, I want to hear the Easter story, how many of you, do you think you could do it? Do you think you could do it? Some of you might be able to do it, some of you not. Okay, so we are going to watch the retelling of the Easter story through the eyes of a child. All eyes ahead. After Jesus died, they put his body into a tomb. The soldiers rolled a huge stone in front of it. They said, there, that should do it. We don't want anyone stealing Jesus' body. So then three days later, Mary came to the tomb. That huge stone was rolled away. Mary looked in the tomb. There were two angels in the tomb. Mary was frightened. She said, ah! <laughs> she said, what are you guys doing here? One of the angels said, don't be afraid, Mary. And Mary said, where's Jesus? And then another angel said, he is risen, just like he had said. She said, well, then, where is he? We don't know because he is risen. Why don't you go find him? Okay, but do you know the way that he has risen so I can go find him in that spot? Uh, well, we don't know because we didn't see him rise <laughs> and Mary says well I'll go look for him all around the town and the angel says okay well go look for him so Mary's in a big hurry and he she bends into a guy Mary says I'm sorry and the guy says it's okay and Mary says I'm looking for Jesus. And the guy says, Mary? And Mary says, Jesus! You are alive. You have risen, just like you have said. Can I say the end? Yeah. The end. Let's give her a round of applause. It's harder than it looks, okay? You think it's so easy. You tell the story. All right. So as I was reading the four different accounts and as I was watching all these fun little videos, I was thinking about Bible heroes and men and women that we can look up to. And so my kids in the audience, I want you to help me out here. Help me out for a second. Who are some men and women in the Bible that we can look up to that we can say, this is a good role model? Who can we look up to in the Bible? Help me out. What? Esther, yes, Esther from the Old Testament. Who's someone else that we can look up to? A Bible hero. David, Jesus, the Sunday school answer, Jesus. Who can we look up to in the Bible? Jesus, you've got it. All right, now, from our story today, there's a couple of people I want to highlight, and I want to take just a few moments to think about their life, and I want to hold them up and say, they did some things really, really well. People that we can admire and look up to. I want us to, to think for a moment about Mary Magdalene. She's a woman in the first century. She came from a really hard background. We don't know all the details of her life. We know she came from a small fishing town, Magdala. And we know that whatever she had been doing in her life, she had attracted and was, was tormented by seven demons. And Jesus healed her from all seven demons. We know that she was one of the disciples that made it all the way to the cross. By the time Jesus was being crucified, all of the disciples, except for one and some of the gals, all of them had scattered. Only a few of, his, of the people that had followed him made it to the cross, and Mary Magdalene was one that stood there at the crucifixion. She is one of the eyewitnesses. Think about the bravery 
that it would have taken to stand by Jesus in the moment when he's dying. This is Mary Magdalene. She was also, after he died, one of the first ones to the tomb. She is also the first eyewitness to see Jesus raised. Isn't that amazing? Mary Magdalene is an amazing hero that we can say, wow, fantastic. And if I had to boil all of that down into one word, I would say Mary Magdalene was devoted. And in that very same way, you and I are to be devoted to Jesus, to say, I'm with him no matter the cost. I'm with Jesus. We need to be devoted like Mary Magdalene. He is risen. All right. So if anyone is late to the show, if you are a kid, and by kid, I even mean kid at heart, uh, when we say he is risen, you're going to repeat he is risen indeed, and the kids are going to jump up and see who's the last one to jump up onto their feet, and we'll see. We'll try one more. So if you're a kid or a kid at heart, he is risen. All right. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So... The second person I want to highlight from our story is actually the writer of this gospel. We're going to look at the Apostle John. He was a humble fisherman from Galilee. So not, not one of the, the learned men. We, we know that, that he came from very humble beginnings. We know he was one of the twelve. When Jesus said, follow me, he was one that left everything and followed Jesus. And so uh, he's one of the sent ones, one of the, the ones that followed Jesus. And he is the only one of the apostles that was there and watched Jesus die. All of the other apostles had run. All of them were frightened. All of them had made mistakes. They had scattered. He was one of the 12, the only one there at the cross. And one of Jesus' final words from the cross is directed directly at John. If you remember, you remember the story while he's on the cross, he looks to John and he says, John, behold your mother. So even while Jesus is dying on the cross, he's thinking about his mom taking care of his family. Joseph is gone and he wants to make sure that someone will take care of Mary. And so he looks to John, the apostle, who is also the youngest of the apostles, and he says, I want you to take care of mom. Kids, I want you to, to help me out here. What are some of the ways that you can take care of your mom? What are some of the things you can do? Oh, the dishwasher. Oh, I love it. One of the children actually said that. Eric, what's one of the things you can do to help take care of mom? Help. Be a helper. Yes. What about, what about listening when mom speaks? Maybe, may, maybe. Maybe some of the teens are like, oh, no, I can't believe we're going there. But... When we're looking at the life of John and we're thinking Jesus trusted John with his mom, what a wonderful, important charge. From that day forward, John took care of her like she was his own mom. In the same way as God asks us to take care of and to honor and to love our own mothers. Interestingly, John, who was the youngest of the apostles, gets, lives to the oldest. He, he gets to be the oldest living apostle, and we're pretty sure that John's gospel is the last one to be written. There were some things in the first three gospels that the other writers hadn't focused on, and John wanted us to see something very, very clearly. What do you think that was? What do you think was so important that John was like, I'm going to write an entire book to make sure you get this one point. What do you think that one point is? Help me out. What is it? You don't know? Oh, it's for the end of the sermon. We want to jump ahead to the end of the sermon. So, uh, <laughs> John, son of Zebedee, I want us to learn to be giving like John was giving. He didn't start out as a great giver, and yet, as he met Jesus, and as he spent those three and a half years walking with Jesus and, and learning from Jesus, we find his life is completely changed from being a humble fisherman to being someone who is willing to give and willing to lay down his life to say, Jesus is Lord. He is risen. You got it. All right. There we go. All right. So in the cave. Okay. So we've got, we've got a cave representation of where Jesus was laid. So, and is the rock rolled over the cave or has the rock been moved yet? The rock, it's Sunday. The rock has already been moved. You've got it, Eric. Excellent, excellent. So the third person, and this is the easiest one for us to say, that we are to be like is Jesus of Nazareth, 
the unique Son of God. Jesus was motivated by love. At every point when, when he was in the garden and he was struggling with knowing how painful the cross and the crucifixion was, when he was arrested and unjustly tried and when he was brought before uh, the high priest and the father-in-law of the high priest and before Pilate and before Herod and again before Pilate, at any of those moments he could have stopped this entire farce. But he didn't. Why did he not stop it at any of those moments when he could stop it? Because he loved you and he loved me. He loved us enough to take the charges that were not true. He loved us enough to take the beatings on our behalf. Our sin meant someone had to die. Our sin meant someone had to pay the price. And he said, because I love you, I will pay the price. Imagine for one second. So, so close your eyes. Imagine. Some of you still have your eyes open. Close your eyes. I want you to imagine for a second. Imagine, uh, especially for the young ones, imagine you're driving a beautiful new car. You're driving a beautiful new car and you're trying to impress someone and you go way over the speed limit and you look down and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going 120 miles an hour. And then the dreaded blue and red, pew, and you get pulled over. And the cop says, do you know how fast you were going? And you look up at the cop, you say, do you know how fast I was going? And the cop looks at you and says, I don't think you can even afford this ticket. This is going to be $3,000. Imagine someone stepped in and said, I'll pay your fine. Except our sin debt, what we owe, you can open your eyes again. For those of you that are still imagining, good, excellent. You're playing along, that's good. He is risen. Yes, yes, yes you got it, excellent, perfect. He is risen to pay the price. <laughs> now I have to be careful with my phraseology, right? Motivated by love for you and for me, he covered over all of our wrongdoings, all of them. From, from the very youngest memory, from the very moment that we could make choices and made wrong choices, all the way to our last wrong thing we have ever done, he covered over all of that because he loves you and because he loves me. And then I want us to think, Jesus was humble. He stepped down out of the glories of heaven, having all of the riches and the beauty of perfection. He stepped down onto the planet that he made for you and for me. He was humble and he served. He was gracious. He was kind. He deserved to be served, and yet he was the one that served and loved us. He laid down his life for you and for me. And there is no more important message for us to remember and for us to remind each other and for us to share with those around us that he laid down his life so that you can live forever. This is one of my favorite pictures of Jesus because something about his gaze, about how much he loves you and me, I get from this photo and it's one of my absolute favorites. We are to be like Jesus, the son of God. He is risen. risen Some of you are getting there. Some of you are getting there. (laughs) And then when you're sitting in some other church service somewhere and they say he is risen, they're like, what is going on? All right. So I want to take just a moment and we're going to watch a quick uh, rundown of what could this have actually looked like for Mary and for, for Peter and for John? What would it have looked like in the first century for this to take place? Let's take a look together. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb. The two of them were running, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and saw the linen cloths, but he did not go in. Behind him came Simon Peter, and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the cloth which had been around Jesus' head, 
It was not lying with the linen cloths, but was rolled up by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture which said that he must rise from death. Then the disciples went back home. Mary stood crying outside the tomb. While she was still crying, she bent over and looked in the tomb. And saw two angels there, dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head, the other at the feet. Woman, why are you crying? They asked her. They have taken my Lord away, and I do not know where they have put him. Then she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you crying? Who was it that you were looking for? She thought he was the gardener. So she said to him, If you took him away, sir, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary. She turned toward him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni. This means teacher. Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet gone back up to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to him who is my father and their father, my God and their God. So wonderful and so precious is his word and that he loves us that much. In 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds us, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits from those who have died. For since death came through a human, the resurrection of the dead also has come through a human. For as in all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Paul's point here is for everyone that says yes to Jesus and by faith says, puts their trust in him, they will be made alive again now and forevermore. Jesus began that work at the cross by taking on the sins of the world. And after three days, he rose again to show us what is our future, your future and mine. The resurrection points us to the perfection that we will one day have, that we yearn for right now. It's so amazing to think that, that God that began that work in us will be faithful to complete it in each one of us. How many of you are... are old enough to say, oh, you can even sleep wrong, and you, you wake up and you're like, I don't know that I can move. I'm, come on, some of you, a couple of you. <laughs> you. You wake up, not refreshed, you wake up and you're like, wait a second, that didn't hurt when I laid down. Why does it hurt now? <laughs> our, even our bodies point to the, fa the fact that we deal with imperfection now. The resurrection and the resurrected Christ shows us that is our future amazes me that uh, as we continue through the story, Jesus can, can walk into a locked room and surprise all of them. It, there is no limit to what a resurrected body can do. It is amazing if we put our faith and trust in him. He is risen. Ah, a couple of you got it. All right, excellent. There we go. So I want to call the band up because we're also going to take a little bit of time. We're going to do communion today. And I, I want to suggest four very simple things for us to take away today, some to pay close attention to. First of all, I want us to learn to be devoted like Mary Magdalene, to love the Lord and to be willing to stand up for him. I want us to learn to be giving like John was giving. I want us to be loving like the Lord Jesus. And the last thing I want to suggest to you and to I is to be surrendered to the King of Kings. If you have not surrendered your life to him, no better day than on Easter Sunday to say, Lord, I give you my all. And sometimes we have to re-surrender our life. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me. When I was younger, 
I would, I would say, Jesus, I'll give you all of it. All of it is in your hands. I'd surrender all of my life to him. And then sneakily, next week, I'd be like, I'll take a few of those things back. Hey, Jesus, I got this one for you. Don't worry about it. Sometimes we have to re-surrender our life and say, Lord, help me to stay on track with what you want and not what I want. He is risen. Got a couple of you. Excellent. Wonderful. So let's take a moment. Uh, and let's pray together, and then we're going to worship and then partake in communion together in just a minute. And so, uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for your hand of mercy and grace. God, we are so grateful for who you are, and we want to be more and more like you. I pray for those of us who have things that we need to surrender, things we need to leave at the cross and, and stop taking up again, those old hurts, those old wounds. Even right now, Lord God, I, I know that there are things in my life that I want to put right there and let go of. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are so patient and so kind with me and with us. I pray for those who have never put their faith in you, who've been coming to church and have been around the message enough to know what it is, but have not said yes to you yet. And I pray, Jesus, that, that right now in this moment, they would pray a simple prayer of faith and say, Lord Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for rising on the third day to show me that you are who you say you are. I surrender my life to you. Help me to walk in all of your ways and to lay down the ways of the world. We thank you so much for making us your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so stand up on your feet. We're going to do our final benediction, which is our closing blessing. Uh, and I'd like you to do, we're going to do something we don't normally do. But uh, as long as you're not uh, sick and coughing up along, I want you to take the hand of the one next to you. Take, take the hand of the one next to you. Because as a family, this blessing doesn't just belong to us. It belongs to us, the family of God. So grab that hand. Some of you are like, I've got really cold hands. <laughs> and if you have an open hand, you can open that hand. So, God, give us the wisdom that is from above, that is first pure and peaceable and gentle, willing to yield and full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. May we now have the fruit of righteousness that is sown in peace. Let us be the ones who make peace by your spirit, by your power forever and ever. To you be the glory forever. Amen. Be blessed, beloved. I hope you guys don't disappear. We've got a potluck next door and lots and lots of food. So I hope to see you next door. <laughs>